So we are in this series uh, on the Gospel of Luke, and I, I've really been enjoying it. And there's some things that have jumped out to me that I did not know, and and I'm you know it's super cool to be able to learn things and see things like that. But I want to begin with a story that both startled me in a very bad way, and then really startled me in a good way. It's a super cool story. It starts off bad, but it ends great, and I love that. And so there, there was this young guy, this young 18-year-old guy named Derek Black. I'd never heard of Derek Black, but Derek Black was a part of the white supremacist, uh, white nationalist movement, national supremacist movement. I don't even know how to say that. And they had a conference in 2008, November of 2008, You'll remember November of 2008, Barack Obama had just been elected president of the United States, the first person who wasn't a white man elected to uh, that office. And so the white nationalist supremacist movement had a conference immediately following, and Derek Black, an 18-year-old kid, was one of the main speakers in this conference in Memphis, Tennessee. His dad, Don Black, is the guy who invented the world's largest white nationalist supremacist uh, website. I never heard of that. It's uh, something called Stormfront. And then his godfather was a guy named David Duke. I had heard of David Duke, formerly the Grand Wizard of the KKK. And KKK, and KKK, say that right. Um, and so Derek Black is this 18 year old kid who's a part of this and he's going to college. But what he would do is he would keep his identity secret at college because he knew if people knew who he was. He would become an outcast at college, and people wouldn't talk to him and maybe even be abusive toward him. And so he kept his identity secret, and he would sneak out early in the morning, and he would go do a radio show. He was a radio talk show host at the age of 18 for this white nationalist movement, and he would do this radio talk show and then come back to the college campus and, and, and pretend like he was just a regular student. And he was able to do that for three years on this college campus in the state of Florida, and um, he, he managed to get through everything. But he was avoiding a lot of stuff. He was avoiding uh, certain groups of people. He was obviously talking really bad about certain groups of people. And, uh, and, and what happened to him was that someone was writing a paper on terrorist groups. One of the college students was writing a paper on terrorist groups and found his name in, in when they were doing this study. And so on a college campus message board, they outed him. They put his name up there, and they put that this guy, Derek Black, was a white nationalist supremacist, and he's among the students. And then they asked the question, what should we do? How should we treat him? More than 1,000 responses were posted there. And Derek Black said he sat up all night long just reading through those. It was a horrific time for him. He said, I was very unsettled. I was scared. And he wrote a, he wrote a whole book about this. He was interviewed by a number of magazines about it. And so what happened after that now is he's completely the outsider. Like he has no friends. No one will talk to him. He's afraid to leave his dorm room. He's afraid to even go to class. And, and he's isolated because now people know who he really is. And so there's this other guy on the campus named Matthew Stevenson. Matthew Stevenson was an Orthodox Jew, and he was the only Orthodox Jew on the entire campus. Now, Derek Black would have been anti-Semitic, and he said some horrific things about Jews. And then you have Matthew Stevenson, who is an Orthodox Jew, the only one on the campus. Now, when Matthew Stevenson came to this college, being the only one on the campus, a lot of people have questions. You know, it seems weird to them. They don't know how to respond to him. And so Matthew Stevenson, in response to this, decides he's going to have a Friday Shabbat traditional Jewish dinner. Every Friday evening, he's going to have this Shabbat that he's going to do. And he's just going to invite people to come. And so Christians came and atheists came and different people came. And he would just share with them what this supper was that that the Jewish community would eat every Friday evening and explain to them. And he ended up having a lot of friends coming to it every Friday night. And so Matthew Stevenson realizes that this guy, Derek Black, who is a white nationalist, is now isolated. He's an outsider. He's ostracized. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to talk to him. No one wants to be around him. And so Matthew Stevenson, the Orthodox Jew, who has been criticized by Derek Black, goes to him and invites him to come to his Friday night Shabbat. Derek 
Black said he didn't want to go at first, but he said, I wasn't getting any other invitations, and so I decided to go. He shows up, and all the other people that are there at Matthew Stevenson's home, they're all nervous, they're all afraid because they don't know what's going to happen. There's kind of this anxiety of somebody's going to start something. There's going to be words spoken. Maybe there's a fight going to break out, and everybody's nervous. But Matthew Stevenson invites him to his home. He welcomes this enemy into his house. And they sit down and they, they celebrate the Shabbat together. Derek Black didn't even know what it was. And they celebrate it together. And the next week, Matthew Stevenson invites him to come back again. And the next week, and the next month, and for months, he kept inviting Derek to come back. It was so transformational for Derek Black. 2008, he's the headline speaker at a conference for white nationalists. In 2011, he begins writing a book about how he was wrong, about people who were not like him. And it all happened because Matthew Stevenson, someone he hated, was willing to invite him over for dinner. And so here's how it fits into the Gospel of Luke. No, no writer more than the Gospel of Luke talks more about Jesus eating a meal with other people than Luke does. And so here's the title of my message, Eat like Jesus ate. So, now, let, let's, let's unpack this. We, we need to know more about that. I'd love to just say, dismiss, everybody go home, let's have a great day. But let's drill down into it and see exactly uh, what Jesus did. The first thing I want you to know is that Jesus modeled hospitality. Now, when we talk about hospitality, the word, the word hospitality is used actually quite a bit in the Bible and the Greek language, the word hospitality, means to love the foreigner. Now, we think of hospitality. We see the word hospitality. We think of the word hospital. You know, we want to be hospitable. But in the Greek language, it actually means to love the foreigner. In other words, love the person you don't know. Love the stranger. Love the person who's not like you. To really, truly show hospitality is to love people that are nothing like you. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus modeled hospitality, and he did it over and over and over again. In fact, I, as I said, Luke, uh, more than any other writer, talks about Jesus eating a meal with people. One theologian said it like this. He said, when you read the Gospel of Luke, you should notice that Jesus is always either on his way to a meal, eating a meal, or having just left a meal. And in every single case, with the exception of the last one that, that Luke mentions, he's always eating with someone who is not a part of his inner circle. And, and I'm going to show you a list on the, the screen here. Luke chapter 5, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners in Levi's home. Now, <laughs> even in our day, we're not sure we want to eat with tax collectors, right? Like, I've never invited the IRS over to my home. One time I played around in golf with an IRS agent, but I didn't know he was with the IRS to whole three. I might have done differently had I known that <laughs> beforehand. Um, and, and so, but this is Jesus. He's eating with tax collectors. In their culture, people didn't like tax collectors. Tax collectors were outsiders because they were abusing their position. Luke 7, he's eating with Simon, the Pharisee. In, in his home, Simon was a Pharisee. The Pharisees hated Jesus. They were against Jesus. Luke 9, Jesus feeds 5,000. So he just has kind of a, a men's gathering and uh, breaks the bread, breaks the fish. And they have this big fish fry with 5,000 people. But people remember that and it changed their life. In Luke chapter 10, he's in Mary and Martha's home eating with them. And of course, they were close friends, but they had a whole bunch of people coming over to their house. They had this big celebration inviting people over. In Luke chapter 11, again, he's in a Pharisee's home and he's with teachers and he is actually explaining to them how they're not truly following God's word. In Luke chapter 14, again, he's in a Pharisee's home and he rebukes them for not inviting the poor to come over and eat with them. Luke chapter 19, again, Zacchaeus, he's a tax collector who'd come to see Jesus, and, and, and Jesus said, hey, I'm going to come eat at your house. And then Luke chapter 22, again, Jesus eating a meal. This time, it's the Last Supper with his disciples, but he already knows who Ju Judas is. And he could have had this meal without Judas, but he makes sure that Judas is there. And then I, in Luke chapter 24, it's the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He's already, been, he's already died. He's been crucified on the cross. He's resurrected. They're on their way back to Emmaus. They're sad. Jesus comes up alongside them. 
and says, hey, what's going on? And they look at him in startled disbelief, like you don't know what's happened. And he asked him to share. And they begin telling Jesus himself about how the Messiah had been crucified and how disheartened they were. And, and so he begins to open up the word of God to them. And when he gets to their home, they invite him in to share a meal. And, and when I was studying, I just I actually got a big kick out of this, started laughing. Um, see, I, I think I'm funny. And so sometimes I just have to laugh by myself. But this, this was awesome to me. Luke chapter 24, verse 41. This is Jesus after the death, burial, and resurrection. This is glorified body Jesus. So he shows up, and they're just standing there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Like, they're excited he's there, but they're just in awe. And what's the first thing he says to them? You have anything to eat? I just love that. He just walks in, and they're startled, and the only thing he can think about is food. That's a real man. And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and, 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 the, and, they, and he ate it, and they just watched him as he ate. But this is Jesus modeling what, how you and I should live, how we should go about our lives. I was talking to Penny Smiling this morning. I was excited about my sermon, so I preached it to her first. And she shared with me about her, was it your mom or your grandmother? Her mom would always have something either coming out of the oven, something on the stove, always ready for somebody that was going to come by. And she would say, who's coming by? And her mom would say, I don't know, but there may be somebody coming by. And when they come by, I want to be ready for them. There's just this idea that, and and, and I think about what God has done here, that you can take Derek Black, who's a white nationalist, and you can take Matthew Stevenson, who is an Orthodox Jew. Naturally, they would dislike each other, but over breaking bread on a Shabbat meal, they began to get to know each other, and the walls begin to come down. And so you think about Penny's mom always having food, either on the stove, coming out of the oven. My, my grandmother, I would love to go over to my grandmother's house. I don't know. She didn't like black-eyed peas, but she always had black-eyed peas on the stove. And I, I really, I never understood that. To this day, I don't understand that. But she would also, there would always be a peach cobbler there or something like that. And man, I miss my grandmother. And, and she always had that. There's just this idea if somebody stops by, and, and, I, and I want us to, to capture the essence of what Jesus was doing when he sat down to eat meals with these people. Jesus could have looked at every single one of them. He could have just looked them straight in the eye and said, you're a sinner, you're wrong. If you don't make things right, I'm going to zap you and you're going to die right here. He could have done that. And a lot of times that's the approach that we want to have toward people, that we want to look at them, we want to set them straight. And Jesus didn't do that. He sat down and he broke bread with them. And it was always with people that were not like him. It was outside of his, his circle. And this is the truth that we need to see about God, that he likes people that are outside of his circle. Point number two is God loves a stranger. I, I, now that I'm saying that, I wish I had a title. God loves those outside his circle. Because we all have a circle. We do. Every one of us has a circle. I've, this has happened to me oftentimes where I've invited people to be a part of something. And their answer will be, who else is going to be there? And here's why they ask that question. This happens all the time. We all do it. I've done it. You've done it. We all do it. Who else is going to be there? Because we want to hear, is anybody from our circle going to be there? And if somebody's from my circle is going to be there, then it's okay. I can come. But if you don't list anybody from my circle, then I don't want to be there. But here's what we should be saying. Who's going to be there? Because I want to I wanna connect with some people who are outside of my circle. I want to connect with some people who are not like me. And, and for lack of a better word, they're foreign to my circle. Because I want to do, as the Greek word hospitality says, I want to love the stranger. I want to love the foreigner. I want to connect with people outside of my circle. And God loves them. And he commanded. This is, this is who he is. And we see this in the Bible. I love the way Paul wrote this, and, and I hope it jumps out at you as it jumped out at me. Ephesians 2.11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Every single one of us. 
We come to church acting like we've always been insiders, acting like we've always been a part of, of, the, of the kingdom of God. That's how we come into church, because we've become comfortable with church, and we are insiders now. But we need to remember, we were not always insiders. There was a time when we were an outsider, and maybe even we came to church not knowing what to expect, and we came to church with the, you know, the, kind of the idea of, I'm going to protect myself. But Paul's reminding them, hey, you used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. And the Jews were really good at this. The Pharisees were especially good at this. The Pharisees would call Gentiles, they would call them dogs. In other words, we don't even acknowledge that they're human. They're so outside, we won't even admit that they're human beings. They're dogs. And so Paul's reminding them, you used to be called uncircumcised heathens. You were... They were proud of their circumcision. Wasn't wasn't real. Verse 12, in those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship. You were were a foreigner. You did not know the covenant promises that God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. People who are on the outside, what they want more than anything is hope. Several years ago, Abraham and I read a, a book of dealing with the current culture we're in and all the things that are happening, whether it's transgenderism or the asexuality, all the things that are happening, we were just trying to stay abreast with what's happening. And one of the psychologists, sociologists in that book said something that just jumped out at me and startled me, and that's this, that most people who enter into deviant behavior do not go into that type of behavior, whatever it is. It can be drugs, it can be crime, It'd be immorality, sexual immorality, whatever it is. They do not go into it because that's what they wanted. They go, they go into it because that's who made them feel welcome. Which makes me wonder how many people tried the church first, but the church didn't make them feel welcome, and so they left. That's really good work. He said, you lived in this world without God, without hope. But now... You, you've been united with Christ. You were far away from God, but you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. In other words, you, you, need to, you don't need to forget this, and I don't need to forget this. Every single one of us needs to remember that God loves the people that are on the outside. I wonder how many people have entered into some other abuse, some other evil thing, because they just were accepted by those people. But had, if, had we been accepting, they were here first, and we lost that opportunity because we didn't love them the way we should. We didn't embrace them the way that we should. And this is not just a New Testament thing. This is Old Testament. Exodus chapter 22, 21, God commanded the Israelites. He said, you must not mistreat or oppress the foreigners in any way. Remember, you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. And there should be this this law that is written on each of our hearts that every single person we come in contact with, we must remember that God loves them. And even though they may be a foreigner to our circle, we, we're not allowed as followers of Christ to mistreat them. Let me take this a step further. You're not allowed to ignore them. You cannot be a follower of Christ and ignore people. And so I, I let me just prod you a little bit. Think of the people you work with. Who, who, who at your work is sitting alone at lunch because nobody else likes them? It makes me want to go back to high school and eat lunch at a different table. Because I know as a high school student, there were people I avoided. But had I known this, I would have, I'd like to think I would have done differently. But now I have a chance to do differently. And so the third point is true hospitality heals. And Jesus knew this. When you begin eating dinner with people, Derek Black did not go from being a white nationalist, white supremacist on the first Shabbat. It wasn't even the second Shabbat. It was a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and it was months that Matthew Stevenson kept inviting him to come over for dinner to the point that Derek would eventually renounce white nationalism and write a book about it and go on to the Southern Poverty Law Center and write an apology for who he was 
but he was healed over time over a meal. And you have to do this with the right, it has to be with the right spirit, okay? So hospitality in the Greek language means to love the stranger, but in, in the English language, hospitality, obviously the word hospital, there's the obvious connection there that a hospital is a place for people to go and get healed. And when people go into the hospital to get healed, most often they don't know the people they're working with. The doctors and nurses don't know the people who are coming. But they have one goal. They want to heal that person. And that's the goal that you and, you and I should have. And, and it has to be with the right heart. The Apostle Peter, knowing that this could be an issue, wrote 1 Peter 4, 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. In other words, I want you to go to lunch with somebody and I don't want you to have the attitude that I'm doing it because the pastor said I had to do it. It needs to be with the attitude, Jesus Christ loves the person I'm sitting across from. And one of the things that just kind of blew my mind is this idea that if you will go into that meal, let's just say that we're going to Jersey Mike's together. Can I get an amen? amen. For me, it's number 17, the Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> Baked Lays and, and their cream soda is just, I'm just hungry now. But if you and I go to Jersey Mike's together and we sit down to, to eat uh, a Philly cheesesteak and drink a cream soda and we're sitting there, here's what you need to see. It's not just you and me. It's you, me, and the grace of God. That, that's, it's you, me, and the grace of God. And, 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 the, and the interesting thing about this, and, and this, goes, this goes in so many different directions. Zach Wilkerson, one of the, the men in the church here a few months ago, some time ago, asked me, uh, hey, he's like, hey, you want to go to lunch together? I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go to lunch. I love eating lunch. I do it every day. It's a habit of mine, and, and I do. I love eating. Um, and, and so we went to Jersey Mike's, and, and, and something happened there. We were just going to lunch together, right? Just He's like, hey, let's, eat, you know, let's, let's just hook up for lunch. But in the middle of lunch, he asked me how Lanita was doing. And I didn't realize it. So many people have asked me how Lanita's doing. I'm like, she's doing great. But in the middle of that lunch, I didn't just say she's doing great. I actually broke down and started talking about everything that we were going through, the battles that we were going through. And I walked away from that lunch feeling so good, not, not because of the Philly cheesesteak, although it was good, but he had just given me the chance to just open up to something that, that I didn't even realize I hadn't been able to just get off of my chest. It's that simple. It's that simple. And so the writer of Hebrews says it like this. He says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without even realizing it. And I believe that the truth of the matter is, when you invite someone to lunch who is not in your circle, you're entertaining angels, and you don't even know it. You may be sitting at Mission Barbecue or Jason's Deli or McDonald's, wherever it is, and you are sitting with someone who's not in your circle. You're sitting in the presence of angels, and you need to believe that. And so here's how I want to conclude my message this morning. How will you eat like Jesus ate? How will you do this? How are you going to put this into practice? What are you going to do who are you going to invite to go to lunch with you? Now, and, 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 and be broad-minded about this, because on the one side, there are some people that are real outsiders, real outcasts that I should invite and take to lunch and, and, and sit down with and enjoy. But it, it's not just that. It, it could just be the person who's sitting across the aisle that I've never taken the chance to meet. David and Norma Dundor, uh, family in this church, one of the things that they do that I love is when new military soldiers come in, they just invite them over to their home for a dinner. And as a dad who had a son who lived in the barracks, and then I got to see what the barracks looked like, and then I was mad at every senator, congressman, president, judge, officer, because it's just a horrific case that they were living in, to know that we have families in our church who just look at so 
that soldier doesn't look like someone who is in need, and yet they just invite him over for dinner, and those soldiers love David. And so it, can't, it doesn't have to be something complicated. It doesn't have to be something difficult. It's just looking at my circle saying, you know what? Every time I come to church, I sit with these same people. I go out to eat with these same people during the week. I'm texting these same people. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, calling these same people. And, and if it's your spouse, yes, you should be doing that. But you should be breaking out of that, asking the question, who else might need for me to connect with them? Who might, I I don't know that person sitting over there, and so I may, they just look like they like barbecue, and so I'm going to see if they want to meet me at Mission Barbecue this week at 11.50, because I want to beat the crowd. I don't want to show up at noon, the line's too long. If you get there at 11.50, you can beat the crowd. That's just a tip from me. So how are you going to do it? Seriously, how are, you, how are you going to eat like Jesus ate? And you don't have to go into it with your theology. You don't have to go into it with a, with a mission, like I'm going to mentor them. You don't have to do that. It's just, hey, would you like to meet for lunch? And when you sit down at the table, just ask them, hey, how's it going? How's it going? And it may be that the first time you guys meet for lunch, you don't really talk about all that much at all. But the second time, again, it may take many lunches before those walls start coming down and you begin to open up to each other. But Jesus did this. And if you really want to be like Jesus, and I do, then I need to eat like Jesus ate. And that was with people outside his circle. Will you stand? So my first challenge to you is to actually think about this. I'm not even asking you to spend more money. Like You don't have to buy their lunch. Just, hey, we'd like to meet for lunch. Especially if, if, if you work in a field where you're always having to go to lunch. Just eat with somebody different. And maybe there's somebody here today that you haven't met, that you need to meet. Maybe God has told you, go meet that person and you haven't done it yet, take the opportunity today to step across the aisle and just say, hey, I've been thinking about introducing myself to you for several Sundays, just haven't taken the initiative to do it, but I, I, I want to I meet, and I'm a part of a small group, and I think you would enjoy the small group if you'd like to come. It's that simple. It's that simple. Here's the second way that I want to conclude this service. We have an area down front. Our worship team is going to come and lead us in worship. And I want to invite anyone who'd like to come to the front to come and pray. And if you, it doesn't have to be about what I preached about. It can be about anything. It could just be about you desiring to be closer to God. It could be about your job, your finances. It could be about healing in your body. It could be about some relationship. It could just be a desire for clarity you can come and pray for wisdom it doesn't matter why you come but if you would like to come to the front there is an open area where you can take a step of faith and just come down and say God and pray your prayer and I'm going to come down there and, and I'm just going to put my hand on your shoulder and pray with you Pastor David Hale will do the same and we'll just pray with you and ask God to help you wherever you are in the name of Jesus Christ Father thank you so much for the example that's given to us in the Gospels the simplicity of just eating a meal with someone else, how valuable that is. I pray, God, that you would give us a revelation of that so that we can do that and do it in a way that actually helps people, encourages people. I ask you to help us to do that in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ.